Welcome back to our second episode of our little series on peatlands. And guess what? We're in an actual bog in the real world out in nature. It's glorious out here. It's beautiful. It's special. And so are peatlands. They are unique because of the flora and fauna that they have, which is what we're going to find out a little bit about today because 90% water, acidic kind of atmosphere and environment. And we have our expert, Nula. You're back again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Where are we? Welcome to Lodge Bog. Uh, we're in County Kildare and this is an example of a raised bog habitat. What are they? Like this isn't your bog stand. Well, like, sorry, it is a bog standard. <laughs> what it is. It's glorious out here. Um, is it this is. like a special reserve area or? Yeah, this is a site that's conserved by the Irish Peatland Conservation Council. It's conserved for future generations mm -hmm. and of course us to enjoy today. Yes. Uh, it's conserved for the unique biodiversity that call Lodge Bog its home. It's conserved for the water regulation, the carbon storage and the inspiration it gives to artists and poets. I just throwing that in there because I mean I do feel it's because there's so much happening here like apart from even when we walked out there's like it there's the the springiness the bounciness in it the squidginess but also even like looking down and around in the noises it's 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 a unique space. It is. It's actually very early in the season. So okay. peatland, many peatland plants actually hibernate, so they do. So it's really now at this time of the year that they're only beginning to emerge after the winter hibernation. So the first we've got is our hair, hair's tail cotton grass yeah. or single-headed bog cotton, so which this, we have this, down the white here. here is it? The, this is the white one. This is a classic iconic bogland plant. You only find it growing in boglands, and it's actually the food plant of a very special bogland specialist, the large heath butterfly. Oh, wow. uh, so it's a, a raised bog specialist. We also have down here okay. our bearded lichen. This is a symbiotic relationship, or we might know that as a partnership yeah. between an algae and a fungi living together uh, that can uh, coming together to survive on our peatland. And we also have our heather, which again is another iconic bogland plant. Traditionally, we used to come to the bog to collect it to make a sweeping brush for our home. Wow, really? It's a really dry plant on the bog. Again, this isn't going to flower though till August. Uh, later on in the season. So all of these are quite unique, like, but it is like, uh, it's quite a lot of mixtures of, of browns. And I, some of the pictures I've seen, like is, are, obviously there's so much color as well. Is this because of the season, time of the season? It, it is, yes. So because bogs are wetlands, they have the potential to freeze in the uh, in the winter time. So what peatland plants do is that many of them hibernate. So they retreat underground and their leaf litter is what's actually forming the peat. So these bogs today, this example of lodge bog is still growing. So bog cotton, you can't actually make actual cotton from it, can you? Well, we did try and have a cotton industry in Ireland, but it was unsuccessful. And the main reason being is the seed heads here, they're very short. So it makes a very low grade quality cotton. Doesn't mean that the Irish people didn't use it though. Uh, of course, we would have picked it locally in some of the mountainous areas like the Schlieve Blooms and spun it to make a thread to, to mend our socks. And indeed, if you think about it, we take for granted, we can go to a shop today to buy pillows. But um, years ago, we made our own pillows. And if you were allergic to feathers, it was gonna be very difficult to sleep on a pillow of feathers. So people actually even collected bog cotton to uh, stuff to make a pillow. So there's like, so the sustainability, obviously, like we mentioned before, is about like people economy. And like, so there would have been like a lot of, apart from just cutting turf and peat, there is like, there's life and sustainability in terms of the economy that comes from the plants. Yeah, cranberries and fronds grow on bogs and people would have collected those to make preserves years ago. Um, and the, uh, the, the heather plant is a very dry bogland yeah. plant. We actually use that to make a sweeping brush for our homes. No way. Yeah. I, question though because like you say it's very dry obviously this is 90 percent water H how is it so dry in such a wet environment well it's a special adaptation by holding very little water in the body of the plant it means it won't freeze in winter time so of all the plants on the bog heather is one that actually doesn't have to hibernate so it's one of the tallest plants you'll get in the bog and uh, it can photosynthesize all year round clever i mean like it's nice to see it's such inspiration as well like even like pipes at home freeze and burst at winter but like it like Maybe we should just listen, listen to Heather, whoever she is. <laughs> so what you have here is like, it's still growing. So it's, it's still laying that layers down. So it's yeah. using the, the acidity, the chemistry, the pH, all that kind of stuff that's there to, to build layer upon layer and layer and, and to create this kind of blanket of, of plants on the top. But we're missing some of the color, but we're going to have a chance to see that inside? Yes, at the Bogavala Nature Centre we have a greenhouse of insect eating plants and these are unique to boglands as well but they're just not above the ground yet here on Lodge Bog. Insect Later. eating, they're not dangerous are they? No, not to you and I. Grant, let's go have a look. <laughs> Seamless. 
So we've come back to the IPCC to have a look at what's growing in the greenhouse. Nula, how did you get ahead of me? What have we got here? Well, this is the largest public display of insect eating plants in Ireland and the UK. Nice, impressive. This looks really, really cool. Oh, and we've got the, the sticky ones that we mentioned earlier on. What are these called again? These are our sun juice. Um, so in Ireland, we've got three typical uh, insect eating plants. There are bladderworts, they're found underwater. We have our butterworts, which have a lovely purple flower, and we have our sundews. Each sundew has these 200 tentacles on the, each leaf, and each tentacle has a little blob of glue. So unsuspecting insects get a little bit too close to this plant in our bog lands, and they're gonna get stuck and they've just become breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Awesome. I, I love how clever nature can be, particularly in this kind of environment. You've got something that looks like nectar, which confuses the insects, but its viscosity, it's so sticky, that kind of thickness, the chemistry of it makes sure that their smell, everything else comes together, and then it... They, uh, what are the spirals on the top of, of, of the plant? Well, once the actual sundew traps the insect, uh, what it does is it has to curl up. So the leaf surface curls up to create a, a tummy for itself. It can then release its digestive juices. And once it gets those nutrients from that insect, that absorbs them in through the leaf surface again. That's awesome. What, what else have we got here then? Well, these aren't actually native to Ireland. These are called our pitcher plants. So they've been introduced onto Irish bogs. How they work is uh, they don't move at all. Uh, an insect will land or a fly will land on the lid. Underneath the lid, they have these tiny little hairs. This yeah. offers the fly grip. The fly moves around to the underside of the lid. The hairs run out and oh no, they fall deep oh, into the pitcher. The pitchers are smooth on the inside so they can't climb out and they narrow at the bottom so they can't fly out once again becoming breakfast, lunch and dinner. This is like a, a theme, it seems like everything eats. I'm nearly nervous of the carnivorous plants that are here. But So it seems like the chemistry, the biochemistry, uniqueness of the acidity, the wetness, but the, everything that's on bogs, it's very kind of unique to bogs then. It is, yeah. The plants uh, really have to adapt to this environment. They have to love water. They have to be adapted to the acidic conditions. And in fact, because there's no agents of decay, they're very nutrient poor habitats as well. So obviously, the and there is one particular plant that obviously is the, it's a special, it's called the bog builder. That's it, the sphagnum mosses. Can we take a look at that? Absolutely. Awesome. So Nuala, this is the bog builder, sphagnum moss, talk to me. Yeah, there's over 10 different varieties of sphagnum mosses on raised bogs in Ireland. Uh, some grow in the drier areas and the hummocks, some grow in lawn areas, but we're actually at a bogland pool here and the particular sphagnum moss we have is known as sphagnum cuspidatum. It, okay. It's sometimes referred to as the drowned kitten. Uh, I don't know why, okay. I don't know why, no but asked. it is submerged in water. What we're going to do is we're going to take a, a, just a handful of it out and All we're right. just going to have a, have a look at that if that's okay. Do you want to get yeah, your hands in and I'll get them wet? Yeah, I guess so. Yes. So I put it in and just take a clump of it. Yeah, that's it. And full of ice. Oh, oh, wow. Don't give me out of water. What's interesting about this, the only part of sphagnum moss that's alive is yeah. actually at the tip, at the surface here. So this is the only part that's alive that we see. And if you look what we've after taking it out, what's happened here is as the plant grows up, we're building our bogs one millimetre a year. See how it browns here oh, at yeah, the base yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, the, of the sphagnum moss? That is uh, how it's forming peat. It's big, it, trapping other leaf litter in the bog. And this is what's forming our peat. Um, the sphagnum moss has side lateral arms um, so the ones that go the opposite, uh, opposite, uh, horizontally out, yeah? yeah, and they create external water storage areas and internally in the body of the plant there's a uh, there's water storage areas known as hyaline cells. Uh, so two ways to store so the these, water. I've read that these like 10 times their weight in water they can hold, which is why the bog is able to hold so much. Absolutely. As it rains on the bog, the sphagnum mosses are absorbing this water. And okay, they will slowly release it, but they're, they're that, and this is also why they're really important as water regulators as well. This is awesome. And I mean, so one millimeter, every, like getting taller and taller and taller each time. And if, can I squeeze this? I do indeed. Okay, so if I squeeze this, this is, you're gonna see the amount of, oh my God. That's awesome. <laughs> and then, and so this would have been, so I, I've heard also that these are were exported. During yes, during uh, during World War One, uh, there was a shortage of wound dressing. Our bodies are mainly made of water, yeah. so it was one of the biggest immobilization of people at the time. But sphagnum moss was harvested from our bogs. It was dried out and it was used as a wound dressing no uh, to treat uh, injured soldiers. And those that were treated with it, it's believed, had less infection rates because it has great antiseptic properties as well. 
So do you think that possibly because of the acidity or low oxygen rates or anything, it has something to do with that, that kind of with that low infection rate? Yeah, it's definitely something to do with the chemistry of the bog lands and these sphagnum moss plants. As we know, they are they are the bog builders. They store water. They are really important for carbon storage and water regulation. Yeah, this is awesome. And so, do, like, I mean, the amount of water that they have also is why things don't decompose. It is indeed. And one of the special things about sphagnum mosses is uh, it's only alive at this growing tip here. So we can actually take this, pop it back in the bog. And um, I actually set up a little experiment that I'd love to show you. Okay, well, let's pop these back in and have a look at this. There you go. Bog builders, go. Look at them. Mix them in again. Oh, it's actually warm. Nice. Okay, so Lula, why have we got a balloon in a box? I know, it's not a, a wildlife species. A wild balloon. A wild balloon. <laughs> this is a part of a fair test investigation okay. I decided to set up just over a week ago now. Uh, what the balloon is, it's simply a marker to see what I've done is I've taken an apple, I've buried half of it here in the bog and half of it in the gardens at the Bog of Allen Nature Centre. So fair test comparing one half to the other. That's it. Exactly, okay, so we're going to see like the conditions and the chemistry of what happens in a bog as opposed to what happens in normal soil. So what I'm going to attempt to do now <laughs> is to retrieve the half apple that I have buried beneath the peat surface I'm, here. I'm glad you're doing it because this looks pretty wet and mucky. Yes, note the gloves. Yeah. Uh, also, I've attached the balloon to a string so we can see that here. And as I kind of move up there, you can see how wet the peat oh, is wow. here. So remember, this is a peatland. I just have to keep a marker on my string. Where is it? So this is guiding me as to where I've buried the apple. So so wet, Absolutely. how much water there is in this. Remember 90% water in the bog. Wow, okay, so there's the apple. Okay, we can so see it's still attached to the thing. We could rinse it off. That'd be fantastic. Sure. Oh, it's like, that's pretty. Yeah. It looks like nothing's happened kind of. Yeah, so look at uh, look at this here. So I, again, I'll try and split it in half if I can. Okay. I might not be able to. Oh, it's a bit rough. No, yeah, it's a bit hard. Yeah, I can't, it, it, that's so solid. I can't okay. even split it in half. Okay. So we can see here, um, look at the edges of it. They're still nice and intact. There's yeah. no browning or a, a decay on it. We could technically eat this if I wanted to, <laughs> because again, it's uh, buried in water, but you can see here, you know, very smooth edges of it. Um, yeah, okay, it's been buried in the bog, but it still looks like an apple that yeah, it's only, was it's buried, buried over a week like, ago. Could, well, even a week ago, it looks like it was buried like earlier on. Like, yeah. It doesn't look like it is very much happening. Even if you look at the kind of that side of it where the skin steers, yeah. like that still, that yeah. feels like as if it's just been dropped. Yeah. And again, you know, looking at the edges of it, nice and smooth. So we're going to compare this now to when we've got back in the IPCC. Absolutely. All right, let's go. Okay, so we've seen what the apple was it like in the bog. Let's see what we've got here yeah. with... So again, it's a fair test, so we've set yes. it up the same. So we've got our balloon as a marker. Yep. Attached to the balloon was our wool. And what I'm going to do is just bury down. Remember, we had, or should I say dig down. And what I, we had buried it down 30 centimetres. 30 centimetres, so okay. So bear with me now. It's nice and loose <laughs> because it was buried. And as we know, it was buried over a week ago. Uh, so let's see, can I get right down it, here? It's into quite the, deep. It is, well, yep. Yeah. Let's see, can I find it? Uh, we had to, as I said, the same area. And wow, we've really <laughs> gone down 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to cut this. No, no, we're not. We're going to keep going. We, we're going to believe in you in there this. We there we go. We've got it. Woo. We're fantastic. Uh, so there we go. We've got our apple here. Okay. So we're going to just wash it off and let's see, is there any difference uh, with it? So I've got a bit of... Oh. Excuse me. I've got a bit of water here. And let's see. Maybe you could do that, actually. Oh, yeah, I, I can do it. Of course you can. So I just pour this onto that. Yeah. Yeah. Wash it off and see, is there any difference? in what the okay so i'm gonna take this off here yeah so we can see then so it is different in color in that i'm seeing kind of the edges of it here is starting to break up a bit yeah uh, like this let's break it open okay so it's still nice and fresh on the inside but again it's been only buried a week so uh we'll compare that to the one on the bog so you could so what you're seeing here is that we're seeing like although it's only a little it's only been a week we're already seeing slight differences yeah. over and when you have something over a long period of time like we had the wood in the first episode that was 4000 years mm -hmm. so it's that difference over a long period of time so this is something that people could try themselves and then do like a, a really good chemical analysis and see look over like week 1 week 2 week 3 so something that people could try themselves Absolutely you can see the edges here yeah. of the apple coming internally where it is browning on the inside of it so what you're going to be 
expecting is bacteria, fungi, and eventually worms are going to be coming in here to the edges uh, of the apple. And this will fully decompose into a soil over time. So even only after a week, there you go. Something that you can try yourself at home. Eh, didn't want to eat that though. No, we won't eat this. This will be broken up and put in our compost heap or maybe laid out for the birds. Probably for the best, for the birds.